We've just had a few technical people can't. Can you go and, Sarah, go and apologise to Matt? My... Thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, this is the Strangling Accountability webinar with the Centre for Public Integrity. Um, we've got Geoffrey Watson, SC, who's going to facilitate. My name's Han Albee. I'm the Executive Director. Um, and we're very honoured and lucky to have uh, the Honourable Marilyn Warren here and, and Richard Beasley to talk about the importance of accountability institutions uh, and looking at the independence of the judiciary and the importance of strong uh, royal commissions with teeth. We'll run through uh, 20 minutes for each speaker and then we'll have an opportunity for questions at the end. Um, uh, we'll start with uh, uh, a couple of questions from Jeffrey and then we'll move to questions from the audience so you can um, type them into the Q&A section. Um, I'll pass to Jeffrey now to say a few words um, and then we'll move on to the speakers. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the first lectures, which are going to be presented as part of a series by the Centre for Public Integrity. The series is titled Strangling Accountability. Before I start, I want to acknowledge two things. Where I am today, I'm on land within the Eora Nation, and I'm in a part of it which was the traditional home for the Gadigal people. The people involved in this webinar are spread all around Australia. So the traditional owners of where you are will be different to those where I am. What we all have in common is that we're on lands which for thousands of years were the home to different groups amongst the First Peoples. We can best respect those people by acknowledging that many wrong and bad things have been inflicted upon them. None of us, I'm afraid, will be able to fix that, but each of us should dedicate part of our lives to try to make it better. The second group I want to acknowledge are the Victorians amongst us. We know how awful things have been of late down there for you during your lockdown. The rest of the country is grateful. By your sacrifice, we've made things better and many lives have been saved. Thank you, Victoria. Now, returning to the concept which underpins the lecture series, the idea behind it is to, to do the following, to identify those independent institutions and agencies upon whom all Australians depend so much and those agencies which hold other branches of government and the bureaucracy to account. We want to identify how those agencies have come under threat and what we might be able to do to protect them. When I speak of agencies, I'll just mention a couple. The various auditors general, the various electoral commissions, the various public broadcasters, including the ABC, and here, it makes me sad to do this, but the CSIRO itself. These agencies are under threat. I offer as one recent example the very fine work undertaken by the Federal National Audit Office. You'll be familiar with Leppington Triangle by now. The government's response has been to cut that office's budget. Things are complicated. Today, we've got the benefit of two highly qualified speakers who are going to address specific attacks upon two of our most important institutions, the Judiciary and Royal Commissions. I should tell you before they speak, the purpose of this is not just to inform, it's to encourage those who are listening to push the boundary, to do what, or to assist in doing that which needs to be done to make sure there's a better future. Our first speaker is Marilyn Warren, a woman with many firsts. She was at an early part of her career, a senior policy advisor to the Victorian Attorney General's Department, first woman to hold that role. Marilyn was a barrister, elevated to the Queen's Council where she practised in commercial and public law, and from 1988, a Supreme Court judge. In 2003, Marilyn Warren became the first woman to become Chief Justice of Victoria, and I add, the first woman to become a Chief Justice in any superior jurisdiction in this country. Marilyn Warren blazed a trail for many other women. Chief Justice Warren will speak on the subject 
of maintaining the independence of the judiciary. Thank you, Marilyn. Well, thank you very much, Jeffrey, for that warm welcome and also for your kind wishes about Victoria, which on behalf of all my fellow uh, Victorians, I embrace wholeheartedly. Um, and I thank the Centre for inviting me to speak today on this very uh, important and timely uh, topic. Part of the topic is uh, qualified or based with the expression uh, turbulent times. Um, how could things be perhaps any more turbulent than what we have experienced in the last 24 hours with the US election? And what is going on in the United States bring home, brings home to we Australians the fundamental importance of judicial independence. Uh, I understand that our group uh, today is a mix of lawyers and non-lawyers, so I'm going to start with a very quick tour through what some might regard as Constitutional Theory 101. But uh, I would say to the lawyers present, day in, day out in our work in the law, we probably take judicial independence for granted because we are such bounteous beneficiaries of that in Australia. So I think it doesn't do any harm to revisit some of the principles. If I can assume that there's a general understanding that we have a three arms of government, starting with the Montesquieu principles, if we go on to the Hamilton Federalist Papers, where he acknowledged and emphasised the three arms of government and the fact that the judiciary was the weakest, and if we acknowledge too that the US Constitution was very influential with the founding fathers in drawing up the Australian Constitution, very much enshrined in chapter three of the Australian Constitution. Well, that's the theory. How does it work in practice? What is the legislative framework? Well, federally, uh, there is the Administrative Decisions and Judicial Review Act, and in the states, there are various judi judicial review provisions in the Supreme Court rules and other statutory power. And it tends to be the federal court and the Supreme Courts that deal with matters that do arise that impact on government. There are, of course, the various tribunals across the country, the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, VCAT, QCAT, NCAT and WACAT and so on. And we should bear in mind that there is a difference in Victoria, Queensland and the ACT with the existence of human rights charters. When the courts look at government matters and the exercise of government power, the courts are exercising a supervisory jurisdiction and they will usually exercise a power in the nature of a declaratory or injunctive power. The courts do not engage directly in the oversight of illegal conduct and corruption. That is a matter for investigative authorities, police and uh, directors of public prosecutions, and that only ends up in the courts eventually where there are criminal charges. It is important to acknowledge that our, in our system, our courts are adversarial and the courts themselves do not exercise a power of initiation or investigation. And importantly, and sometimes this is forgotten, particularly when there is criticism about court decisions, courts are bound and constrained by the evidence that is led in the cases before them. And importantly, the way the matters are presented. I want to touch upon something I mentioned uh, back at the beginning, the three arms of government. That leads me to highlight the separation of powers. It is very fundamental to appreciate that there are differences between the judiciary and the other two arms of government. A few salient features. One, the judiciary is not elected compared with the judiciary in the US states. By contrast, the legislature is elected, it acts politically and is subject to public opinion and popularity. Secondly, the judiciary focuses on the facts and decides cases by applying the law. The legislature makes that law and the policies. Thirdly, the judiciary provides reasons for its decisions 
those decisions up to the High Court are subject to review through the appeals process. And perhaps I can put it this way. Judges do not spin, they deliver judgments. Nor do judges politically explain the reasons for their decision. Compared, for example, with a second reading speech by a minister when introducing legislation. And separation of powers has in our constitutional history on occasions been very topical and controversial. So if we reflect back to 1975 and the involvement of some High Court judges in the giving of advice to the Governor General. Now, I want to postulate the question, why does judicial independence matter? Well, as Sir Ninian Stevens said, it lies as the bulwark of our democracy. Our democracy is founded on the rule of law. Let us make some comparisons where a democracy does not exist as we know it. And these are events that have occurred in our lifetime relatively, relatively recently. In Pakistan, the Chief Justice was placed under house arrest. In Fiji, the Chief Justice was sacked on another occasion, a judge arrived to go into court and her way was barred by soldiers with guns. In Papua New Guinea, I have first-hand knowledge of this from the Chief Justice himself. He was sitting in court one day. The Prime Minister sent the police to arrest the Chief Justice whilst he was sitting in court. In Nauru, the Chief Justice, uh, who was an Australian citizen, was refused a visa to return to that country to exercise his jurisdiction. In Venezuela, the Chief Justice was sacked. These are all examples of how governments who have been concerned or dissatisfied or fear constitutional rulings by judges have intervened and controlled the judiciary and not respected the independence of those courts. Let's bear in mind that here in Australia, there are never guns or soldiers outside the High Court of Australia, the Supreme Courts of each state and the Federal Court of Australia. Why is that? Why is that? It's because there is a peaceful acceptance of judicial decisions by governments and the community. Now, that's not to say that there are not occasions where there is criticism of the court's decisions, where the decisions have been politically unfavourable. So we had Prime Minister Menzies in the Communist Party case criticising the High Court. We had Deputy Prime Minister Fisher criticising the High Court after Mabo and Wick. And we had Prime Minister Gillard criticising the High Court after the Malaysian solution decision. But on occasion, the label has been placed on judges of calling them activist judges where decisions are made that are unpalatable. Of itself, this expression is one of denunciation and insult and even derision. It is predominantly uh, applied by external non-legal commentary. It generally gives no identification of lack of methodological rigor by the judge. There are complaints that judges are unelected and elitist. And activism is put forward as the antonym of orthodoxy. But bear this in mind, last week, the federal government announced the appointment of two new High Court Justices. The appointments were celebrated and embraced and their honours in due course will take their seat on the High Court bench. Contrast the appointment of those judges with the process and controversy that occurred in the United States with the nomination of Justice Kavanaugh and the more recent nomination of Justice Barrett and all the, the commentary that has flowed out about the fact that judges will be left-leaning, right-leaning, be activist or non-activist, or be orthodox. How blessed are we in Australia to have an independent judiciary with such commentary 
does not occur very often. I want to turn now to give you a quick overview of cases where the courts have been brought in to determine matters that have had political uh, consequences. In Victoria, there was the case a couple of years ago, the Red Shirts case, where parliamentary staff were allegedly utilised by a political party to operate as political activists. This ended up on uh, before the court of the Supreme Court, including in the Court of Appeal. The court decided the case without fear, favour, affection, or ill will, and there was no political commentary or uproar about the case. A little while later, in 2017, there was a series of cases called the Certain Children Cases. This was a case about, at the heart of it, lay the Victorian government's law and order policy in relation to Victorian youth. It was a case that revolved around the exercise of executive power and the recognition of rights under the Human Rights Charter. The cases did not go well for the Victorian government. But again, the case was accepted and the government went around about its business and applied its operations thereafter in accordance with the determination of the courts. Federally, there have been a number of cases, the migration matters day in, day out in the federal court, um, perhaps the hallmark being the M70 case before the High Court, dealing with border policy. There have been Marbo and Wick, as I mentioned before, dealing with native title. But there are also everyday cases. Very recently in Victoria, there has been uh, a challenge to the curfew that was imposed by the Victorian government on Victorian citizens as a result of the COVID-19 outbreak pandemic. Um, that case came before a single judge in the Supreme Court. It came on, it was dispatched quickly. His honour went away, Justice Ganane determined the matter and he applied the principles of proportionality and in due course determined that the government's conduct and directions were correct and appropriate in all the circumstances. Then there are other cases that are not to do with rights. If we bear in mind commercial cases such as TABCOR and TATS, where a billion dollars was at stake in relation to government behaviour in contracts with the parties. And that case was heard through all the processes and ultimately in the High Court, it ended up unfavourably for the Victorian government. But again, there was no uproar and there was never a suggestion that the judges had acted uh, other than impartially. Um, we're going to talk in a moment about the uh, Royal Commissions and Boards of Inquiry. I remember back in, I think, the year 2000, when I was um, sitting as a trial judge on the Supreme Court of Victoria, I was the duty judge. And on a Friday night, late at night, when everybody else had gone home, I received uh, uh, advice that the Victorian Royal Commission into Ambulance Services had made a decision which caused concern to some parties and those parties wished to bring an application seeking an injunction restraining the Royal Commission. Um, and there I found myself in the dark of a Friday night in winter having to determine a case. Um, but the key or, or, or political key to this case was that the decision was being made on the eve of the Victorian election. And it was made very plain to me that if the disclosure that was being sought to be made was made, then it may very well impact on the outcome of the Victorian election the next day. Um, I have to tell you as a judge, it was a, a pressure cooker case and extremely stressful, but I would like to think that I decided the case in accordance with the rule of law without fear, favour, affection or ill will. Parties went away, some were dissatisfied, other parties went away satisfied. 
And whether or not I had an impact on the state election, I cannot tell you. But I purported as a judge to exercise my judicial power independently. Other areas that the courts demonstrate periodically their independence, which is very important, is the phenomenon we have here in Australia of the courts of disputed returns. Bear in mind that on the weekends when elections are held, whether federal, whether state, whether council, or whether a by-election, each of the federal and Supreme Courts, as the case may be, have a duty judge on deck ready to deal with disputes that may arise in the course of the elections. And also, if there is a challenge to uh, a determination as to an election outcome, those matters can be, and indeed are from time to time, heard in the appropriate court. And there have been a number of cases before the High Court. Indeed, in relation to parliamentary function, as distinct from electoral functions and activities, we need only think of the parliamentary cases that have been determined in the High Court in the last two years as to the eligibility of individuals to sit in the relevant parliamentary chamber. One last area that I would mention, of which judges are acutely aware, and if they are not aware, counsel will remind them. And that is the principle of actual and perceived bias. If there is a question of a judge being at risk of being biased, actually, or on a perceived basis, I have never known in my almost 20 years as a judge and decades before that as a practicing lawyer and barrister, to know the parties to be inhibited or hesitant about making that point before a judge and calling upon a judge to disqualify her or himself or stand aside as the case may be. It is a very important phenomenon and practice in our Australian courts. So there are some observations I make about judicial independence, and I will now hand over to uh, Richard Beasley in due course. Thank you. I'll introduce Richard, but before I do, I just want to say thank you very much for that, Marilyn. And some of the insights actually were uh, new and refreshing to me. I, I felt a chill down my spine about the awesome responsibility which you had to assume on a cold Friday in Melbourne on a at night time with political pressures placed upon you. I, I think everyone would say, thank God the matter was in safe hands. Anyway, thank you very much for your talk. You. Richard Beasley uh, will speak on Royal Commissions. What would he know about that? He's been council assisting in several, most recently in New South Wales, in Ruby Princess, but more importantly, I think, was his role in the Murray-Darling Basin Royal Commission held down in South Australia. Not only that, Richard himself has been appointed by the New South Wales government from time to time and uh, to sit as a commissioner, especially inquiring into areas of suspect conduct in local government authorities. He, Richard also knows a bit about corruption, I believe, because he's also a member of the appeal panel of the Racing Authority in New South Wales. Now, this is a man with wider interests and wider skills. I'll just mention this, and I want to point out I'm not being paid to do so. Richard Beasley is also a successful novelist. To my knowledge, he's written five books. I've read each of them. The first two are on the lighter side. The third, me and Rory McBeath, is heart-wrenching. It's a very fine novel. His two most recent books are cracking thrillers, which would be good for any lawyer in the room. They have introduced a character, a barrister, Peter Tanner. They're very enjoyable. And I might say uh, uh, I'm looking forward to the next one, Richard. Richard Beasley will speak to us about Royal Commissions. Uh, thank you very much, Geoffrey, for that very generous introduction. 
Um, I'm going to talk mainly about, address my remarks, mainly about two of the commissions I've been involved in that were mentioned by Jeff, um, and in particular to the Commonwealth Government's actions and responses in relation to those uh, commissions. Uh, those commissions were the Royal Commission into the Murray-Darling Basin, uh, Basin Plan, and the Special Commission of Inquiry into the Ruby Princess. This is important. These were both state established commissions. Murray-Darling Basin Royal Commission by the government or governor of South Australia, Ruby Princess by the New South Wales state government. Um, I think people, some people might have a slight misconception about uh, Royal Commissions or Commissions of Inquiry and, and what they can achieve. They don't, as we know, resolve in any final way legal rights. What they are, though, in their essence, and this is very important, they are inquiries into the truth of a matter, to find the facts and the ultimate truths. For the Murray-Darling Basin Royal Commission, the inquiry was into the truths of the Basin Plan, a plan that is our most important environmental law and involves the expenditure of about $13 billion. At the heart of that was whether the plan is lawful or not. For the Ruby Princess inquiry, it was an inquiry into the truth of why 2,700 people were allowed to disembark unimpeded um, from that ship, travel around Australia, travel overseas when 900 of them or thereabouts were infected with COVID. As for the Basin Royal Commission, the Commonwealth Government and its various, the various Commonwealth Government departments showed not only a lack of interest in the truth, but did all they could to suppress it. With the Ruby Princess inquiry, the Commonwealth was more selective about the truth that it would allow to be publicly examined. But when it involved a Commonwealth employee, it was totally against that. In respect to both of these inquiries, the commissioners, and it was Brett Walker was the commissioner for both inquiries, his powers to summons Commonwealth witnesses to give evidence and for Commonwealth documents to be provided were either threatened with challenge in the High Court, or which was in the relation to the Ruby Princess, or in relation to the Basin Plan Royal Commission, were challenged in the High Court and regrettably had to be discontinued because of a lack of time, but I'll come to that. Can I start with the Murray-Darling Basin Royal Commission? And, and before I describe the Commonwealth's total lack of cooperation with that, when I say the Commonwealth, I mean the Commonwealth and various government departments, which include the Murray-Darling Basin Authority itself, the CSIRO, the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Environment and Water, I need to very briefly discuss what this Royal Commission was about which involves me very briefly describing what the Basin Plan involves. In 2007, the Commonwealth Government in the dying days of the Howard Government passed the Water Act, which is a magnificent piece of legislation and amongst our most important environmental laws. The Water Act required the Basin Plan to be prepared. Federal Parliament passed the Water Act in 07. The Basin Plan was passed by Commonwealth Parliament in 2012. Um, at its most simple, the Basin Plan involves how much water has to go out of consumptive uses like irrigated agriculture and mining and be returned to our environment, the environment of the Basin, which is about an area of land about twice the size of France, in order for us as Australians to stop killing the wetlands and ecosystems of the Basin. Um, I'm not going to give an environmental talk, but to put it simply, it is no exaggeration that white people in this country have brought what could be described as an apocalypse on our environment and particularly the environment of the basin. It, it's nobody's fault that it doesn't rain enough in Australia. Um, you could blame the National Party for asserting that if they build dams, it'll rain more. But other than that, it's not no one's fault that it doesn't rain enough. And it's no one's fault um, that... Um, Climate change is impacting the basin. It's how we respond to that. Um, there has been, though, a ceaseless expansion on how much food and fibre is grown in Australia, and that has 
uh, done untold damage to the environment of parts of Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia and the ACT. And there's not a lot of water to begin with. Our rivers are very long, but they are hydrologically feeble. More We treat our Murray River as though it's the Amazon. More water runs out of the mouth of the Amazon in 24 hours and runs out of the mouth of the Murray in a year. We don't have much water. It's a very precious resource. The Black Water Act and Basin Plan were designed to redress this. As I said, the Basin Plan's got one overarching goal, which the Murray-Darling Basin Authority was required uh, to implement from the legislation. And that is, how much water do we need to take out of, uh, on average each year out of consumptive uses and return to the environment so that one, Australia starts to fulfil its obligations under a raft of environmental treaties, whether they're treaties in relation to wetlands or migratory birds or the biodiversity uh, treaty, et cetera, and two, to stop the damage being done to our environment. In other words, irrigated agriculture gets to continue and farmers and big irrigators and miners can have water, but just not too much doesn't really sound like a very radical idea. The Water Act in all its glory requires this, what it describes as the environmentally sustainable level of take to be determined on the basis of, quote, the best available scientific knowledge, close quote. In other words, it can't be a figure, a volume of water that a politician wants. It can't be a volume of water that donors to political parties want. It can't be just a made up figure. It is to be determined by and only by the best available scientific knowledge. That was not done. It's a really difficult job to determine how much water the environment needs. You need hundreds of scientists, ecologists, hydrologists, other experts to provide information to ultimately computer modelers. Their job is to work out how much flow has got to go past certain parts of the rivers and the watercourses at certain times of the year, at certain averages per years to stop degrading our environment. As I said, that's all meant to be done by science. Originally, the Basin Authority said for us to achieve what we need to do under the Basin Plan, somewhere between 4,000 gigalitres, 4,000 billion litres of water to 7,000 billion litres of water has got to go back to the environment each year. 4,000 if you want not much chance of saving the environment, 7,000 if you want a good chance of saving the environment, you can take a midpoint figure of 5,500. When the Basin Authority published that work, there was an uproar in the basin, um, the guide was famously burnt on a bonfire, a pretty horrible scene. And 12 months later, without producing any science to back this up, other than to say they had changed their modeling, but by releasing no information that would enable a scientist to check this work, the basin authority said, forget about 4,000 to 7,000 billion liters a year. The environment actually only needs 2,000 750 gigalitres a year, and it will be sweet. In other words, without an explanation other than we've changed our modelling, the Basin Authority in a space of 11 months said, the environment to survive and for Australia to fulfil its international obligations needs um, less than six Sydney harbours full of water than we previously said. South Australia was never happy with that, and that was one of the reasons they established the Royal Commission that Commissioner Walker was the commissioner of, and that ran for 12 months from January 2018. The evidence before that commission was that 2,750 is an unlawful figure. It will not stop the degradation of our environment. It is not an environmentally sustainable level of take. But worse than that, it was not set according to the best available scientific knowledge. And that was a deliberate unlawful act. Walker called it maladministration. You could probably use a stronger term. I won't, I'll stick with him. Maladministration, gross negligence. What was done was this. 
and first of all, I point out that there's a CSIRO report that, that says, as a matter of fact, 2750 is not going to cut it. It won't save large parts of the environment. Put that aside, very important report by the CSIRO. I'll come to another CSIRO report in a minute, but that was a, an important report. But we had sworn evidence at the Royal Commission from ex-employees of the MDBA that said it was a running joke at the MDBA that the amount of water set for the environment was set according to a postcode, a New South Wales postcode. In other words, science might say 5,000 or more billion litres of year has to go to the environment. What the scientists were told at the MBBA was, no, that figure has to start with a two. It became the New South Wales postcode joke as distinct from a Queensland postcode or a South Australian postcode. Um, now, you would think that based on that evidence, the Commonwealth government would be absolutely alarmed and consider that conduct to be disgraceful. That a Water Act says you have to base your, your determination of water to the environment on science and it becomes a political fix. It becomes, frankly, what big irrigators would wear. Um, the Commonwealth government showed no interest in that and I'll come back to that. I'd like to turn to something worse first. The CSIRO was engaged by the Basin Authority to do a report on how how many benefits there'd be to the environment from a 2750 gigalitre plan. They in fact used 2800 gigalitres. Uh, the main author of that report, who'd moved from the CSIRO to the uh, ANU, gave evidence that the Basin Authority were unhappy with the report and that the CSIRO was pressured to make very significant changes to that report in a manner that this um, uh, former CSIRO senior scientist described as, quote, scientific censorship. The, the threat was even apparent that the MDBA might not pay the CSIRO if these changes to the report weren't made. Now, this witness, I guarantee, was telling the truth. He had diary notes, contemporaneous diary notes of every meeting he went to. He had the original draft report. And of course, we had the final report with these terrible changes. And we know as a matter of fact, that the pressure on the CSIRO was so great that after the report was delivered, they had to call in a mediator to deal with staff unrest and the damage done to staff morale. Now you'd think that one government authority pressuring our most senior scientific federal, federal science body would be something, again, the Commonwealth government would find appalling. Again, it showed no interest. I'll come back to that. Finally, in relation to findings of maladministration, scientifically indefensible decisions and gross negligence, these are all findings by Walker. I'll very briefly mention climate change. I'm not gonna give a talk about climate change. The science of climate change dates back to the 1860s. It is not a hoax, it's basic physics. Think of a town that's had a week of 40 degree days on average once a year. Think of a town with 40 degrees for 40 days plus. That's climate change for the basin. The CSIRO told the basin authority, when you do your modeling for how much water the environment needs, it will be quote, scientifically indefensible, close quote, if you don't incorporate climate change projections. They are part of, quote, the best available scientific knowledge, close quote. The Basin Authority knew that if they incorporated climate change projections into their modelling, more water would have to go to the environment. So they chose to ignore that advice from the CSIRO. Again, Walker found that to be maladministration and grossly negligent. Again, you would think that would be something the Commonwealth Government would find appalling. Now, there are a lot of other matters that Walker found to be unlawful and pseudoscience about the plan. Time, not enthusiasm, prevents me from getting into them. But I think those three cover it enough. One, the 2,750 gigalitre amount was set by, frankly, irrigators in a political fix, not by science. Two, the CSIRO gets heavy to change a report. And three, climate change projections are just ignored. The Commonwealth Government's response to this 
and to Brett Walker issuing summons, summonses for documents and for Commonwealth employees to give evidence was this. One, you can't talk to a Commonwealth employee and you can't have our documents. Two, you can't talk to a former Commonwealth employee. Now we did, and they didn't injunct us, but that's what they said. Three, you can't have a single document we've got. And four, thanks for your summonses. We'll see you in the High Court. Before I give um, my opinion as to why I consider that approach from the Commonwealth to be so disgraceful about an inquiry that's designed to get to the truth and not determine legal rights, in other words, is not a trial uh, and is in the public interest, it's about our environment, I better give brief reasons as to why the Commonwealth says they did this. First of all, they had a point about the uh, construction of the Royal Commissions Act of South Australia. I won't get into that because that could have been fixed by an amendment if it was correct. The main thing they said was this, and this is from the written submissions that were lodged by the Commonwealth and the Basin Authority. Obviously, this is a summary, but what they said was you, Brett Walker, when you service with a, as a state-based Royal Commission Commissioner, when you service with a summons, for a witness that's in a Commonwealth employee or for our documents, you are interfering with or restricting the Commonwealth's executive capacities. In other words, a Melbourne corporation type point. Now, if a state law really did purport to interfere with the law of the Commonwealth or another um, state, of course it's invalid. But the idea of seeking documents or compelling Commonwealth witnesses to talk about water and the environment, to suggest that's really interfering with the Commonwealth government's capacity to operate, that is a stretch. But consider this, the basin plan is a legislative instrument, but it is an inter intergovernmental agreement also, an agreement between the Commonwealth, New South Wales, Queensland, Victoria, SAACT. It's our, about our most important environmental law and our most important resource. That resource is not coal, it's water. And one of the parties to that intergovernmental agreement, it doesn't matter which one says, look, there's a problem here. We think this is unlawful. There's this evidence that points to that. Now you'd think the Commonwealth's response to that, bearing in mind cooperative federalism would be, okay, we better get to the bond than that. Instead, the Commonwealth's response was, see in the High Court. Unfortunately, as I said, there was a government change in South Australia. They refused an extension of time to Walker, which meant there wasn't gonna be enough time for a judgment, even if Walker was successful, South Australia was successful, uh, which meant those proceedings were abandoned. Now, I, the, the Commonwealth's re response and attitude here is, is appalling in my view for more than two reasons, but I'll, I'll give you two. First of all, what does that say about cooperative federalism? You've got this intergovernmental agreement, you've got one party to it raising proper evidence that something's gone wrong, that there's maladministration and illegality, and the Commonwealth reaction is bad luck. We're not cooperating. Leaving cooperative federalism aside, there's another reason that response is appalling. As I said, a Royal Commission's an inquiry into the truth. The truth being uncovered here was that the Basin Plan is unlawful. It's potentially a waste of $13 billion. The CSIRO was heavied. Climate change was ignored. You'd think the Commonwealth Government would be interested in that. Instead, no, we are not interested in the truth. We will literally see you in court. In my view, that's inexcusable. I really briefly come to the Ruby Princess, which was a case of deja vu. Same commissioner. This time, as I said, an inquiry into how mainly New South Wales health officials decided, despite rising rates of influenza-like illness on this boat, and I mean really uh, rising, rapid, rapidly rising rates of influenza-like illness on a boat, um, 2,700 people were, were allowed unimpeded to get off the boat, and it turned out 900 of them had COVID, and they spread that in parts of Australia and overseas. Walker found that to be a mistake, a really bad mistake, but an honest mistake. Hard to work out how it happened, but it wasn't because good people weren't trying and it wasn't systemic error. 
When the inquiry was called, the Prime Minister said there would be full cooperation from the Commonwealth with the inquiry. As Walker said in his report, that turned out to be somewhat of an exaggeration. During the time that people were disembarking this ship, but before full disembarkation, in fact, at the early stages, a Border Force officer, a Commonwealth employee, was given some health information and misread it. It had indications that a number of people had tested negative to flu. He thought it was COVID, despite the form saying, this is a flu test, not a COVID test. That's a bad error. It's hard to know how it happened, but it was honest. Walker wanted to get to the bottom of it. He also wanted to get to the bottom of the grant of critique to this ship, which is the permission for people to get off the ship because it seemed very murky because whilst it's based on New South Wales health advice, that permission actually has to be given by a Commonwealth officer. And it was very difficult to determine whether how critique was granted and whether it even was. So he wanted to summon some witnesses about that. Again, he got the same response for the Commonwealth. We'll give you a voluntary submission. In this case, it was a very detailed and good submission. They gave us some documents. Uh, they were helpful in other ways, but when push came to shove about a compulsive process like a summons, again, it was see you in the High Court. Uh, I think that is again, a poor response because this was significant. It was still significant to find out the truth of what had happened from various Commonwealth officers, albeit the overarching decision was made by New South Wales health officials. Um, so again, that shouldn't have occurred. Can I complete my remarks with this? In 2018, Brett Walker gave the Whitlam oration and uh, I hope I'm forgiven, forgivably paraphrasing him, but he said that it was clear enough to him that there are people in Canberra who think they know better than the rest of us. They think that it's better that we don't have enough information to question them. What information is, is released is tightly controlled. When it in, is released, it looks like and often is a media release. Even the MDBA's so-called scientific reports, frankly, read like long press releases. Walker's view was that, that this um, secrecy has no place in a modern democracy. And this in part reminded me of a speech I'd heard given by Kerry O'Brien, the former um, ABC journalist at the University of New South Wales a few years ago. One of the things he touched on was the deterioration of public discourse and the lack of involvement by young, talented people in politics, political arguments and policy debates. Because as he said, nobody but the political class often has the time. I would add also no one but the political class has the full amount of information they should have. And that is what the maladministrators of places like the Basin Authority rely on. They can fob off scientists, but what they don't want is an educated and engaged public because that's when things get difficult for them. A Royal Commission or another type of inquiry is really important to get to the truth of the matter and convey to matters and to convey to people in a form that they can understand what that truth is. And in my view, it's unforgivable for any government to run interference on that process. Can I finally finish this way? Jeff gave a welcome to country at the start of his remarks. The Aboriginal people had a basin plan. It was this, quote, don't be greedy. Take no more than you need. Respect everything around you, close quote. That's a much simpler plan than the unlawful plan we have, but it's no worse because of that. Thank you. Well, it's a gut reaction when a speaker has finished to say thank you. I'm not sure whether that's the right thing to say there, Richard, because quite frankly, there was a lot of that which was truly disturbing. The observations about the treatment or maltreatment of the CSIRO are, are shattering. The idea that in a federation, and we've been struggling around long now for 120 years, that we can't come to grips with the federal government cooperating with the state government at such an important level 
frankly, is disturbing. I should say, but, Jeff, the C CSIRO denies this. They weren't prepared to put a witness in the witness box to deny it. They lodged a five-page submission saying it didn't happen. Well, what I'm going to do is throw this over to some questions. Now, what the audience won't know is that due to a lack of technological skills, Han Albee was going to show me how to receive those questions so that I could relay them. I may need your assistance here, Han, because uh, if questions are coming through, I've got to find them. I think I've found one. We haven't received any questions in the chat or the it was a discussion. Yet from the audience, but if people have questions, um, they can put it either in the chat box well, well, or in the Q&A box and um, either I or Jeffrey will find them. Um, I might I, maybe I just did suggest, receive... um, while we wait for some questions to come in, Marilyn had some interesting thoughts on rural commissions as well um, that we were discussing before um, the session started. So I might just ask her to um, relate some of those thoughts, if you don't mind, Marilyn. Yes, certainly, and, and thank you very much, Richard. I, I found that fascinating and um, concerning, as Geoffrey has said. Um, three aspects of Royal Commissions, which strike me as critically important, are the terms of reference as drafted for the Royal Commission. Politically, it is, uh, I'd imagine, not too challenging to be able to craft terms of reference that uh, will constrain a Royal Commission. Uh, so that is something that is to be looked at. The second thing is, and sometimes this is not talked about, and perhaps you, you will be too humble not to, to not respond on this, Richard, but I regard the quality of council assisting a Royal Commission as critical. Uh, if we think of the role of Rowena or uh, QC in the Banking Royal Commission, and of course your role, Richard, in the uh, Commission and Inquiry you mentioned, it is so, so important because that person will take a very significant lead in as to the evidence and the presentation before the Royal Commissioner. Um, we might think of uh, Jack Rush QC, who led the Royal Commission into the Black Saturday bushfires in Victoria. Um, very, very important. Also, I think something that is sometimes not talked about enough is the selection of the actual Royal Commissioner or the panel, as the case may be, and to pay particular heed and attention to the experience of the commissioner or the inquirer, if it's a judicial inquiry. Now, I don't mean to suggest by that, that um, people are appointed who are not competent, but if you have a person who is a, a very ex experienced judge, former judge, experienced senior counsel, they will bring the rigour and discipline of the courtroom to the fore in the Royal Commission. We saw this very much play out with Commissioner Hain in the Banking Royal Commission. Um, there are some reflections I have. Richard, you might like to respond. Um, look, in relation to the Banking Royal Commission, what I found um, amazing to a degree was how little time all the council had in that to prepare to start hearings in relation to what is incredibly complex subject matter. Um, with the Royal Commission I did in um, the Murray-Darling Basin, we had a period where we travelled around Australia to do some community consultations, which did give me and all the lawyers involved some time to read into um, really important, really um, uh, complex scientific subject matter. Uh, so we had slightly more time. But your point about um, 
two things you raised. One was the drafting of the terms of reference. I think in relation to the Basin Royal Commission, the South Australian government deliberately drafted very widely. One, one term of reference was simply, I'm shortening it, but is the Basin Plan lawful? That essentially allowed Walker to choose whatever he wanted to look at. Um, so that was drafted by a government that wanted a far reaching inquiry. Um, of course, the opposite could occur. We could have really narrow terms of reference that constrain uh, an inquiry from um, looking at uh, matters more broadly. The other issue you raised, and this has been said to me a few times, I, I, I don't think I want to express my own view because I'm not sure what it is at the moment, but other council who have been involved in many royal commissions or, or very long-standing royal commissions have often expressed the view to me that they think it's better that a, a judge or a retired judge sits as a royal commissioner. The reason they give is that if a barrister is chosen, they feel that the barrister might make the mistake of entering the fray too much, whereas an experienced judge has that training experience from being a judge of, of being slightly uh, less inclined, for example, to take over the examination of a witness, things like that. So that view certainly been expressed to me. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I have my own view. Um, and, and I've got to be careful about it, given that I've, I've also conducted, as a barrister, conducted inquiries, including one involving Mr. Watson. Uh, I can see a couple of questions there on the... I think I can pass on a couple of questions. The, uh, there's a good one. It's mainly for you, Richard. Uh, this is really a reference back to Kerry O'Brien and his idea that of this inability of uh, the general population to get engaged and rather it being in the hands of people in Canberra. Yeah. A good question has been asked. Who are those people? Where was it that you were receiving the resistance to cooperation? Was it from politicians and or bureaucrats? Um, in the Basin Royal Commission, a meeting had been organised for Commissioner Walker to meet with the Basin Authority, the CEO and some of its scientists. Before that meeting took place, Brett published a position paper which didn't address some of the factual matters I've said, but he put out a position paper saying I haven't reached a final view, but I'm highly inclined to the view of most of the, the lawyers that expressed a view on this, that the Water Act has been misconstrued by the Basin Authority in the way they've put the Basin Plan together. The response to that was that meeting was cancelled. When we asked why, the Basin Authority said literally, quote, we're too busy. We're too busy to meet with you. Um, so it started there, and as soon as Brett issued summons and documents and material, and I'm deeply suspicious of this because it came after he'd issued a position paper saying, I think this is being buggered up as a matter of law, not just a matter of fact. Um, that's where the resistance came, and, and we were straight proceeding with it in the High Court. Um, there, was a, there was a question here, Jeff on a slightly similar point about media only exposing what's convenient. I think the problem with the Basin Royal Commission, Ruby Princess was on the news every night because it was just on the news every night. Basin involves the environment, it's technical, it's expert. That's hard for newspapers, it's hard for radio. There were, there's certainly people like Ann Davies in The Guardian um, and, and other journalists. Um, who have um, followed the Royal Commission, but it wasn't getting much exposure. That all changed as soon as a million dead fish turned up in the lower Darling River. Because then you've got a photo, and then it became important. Brett naturally asked the South Australian government, um, can I have an extension to deal with this? And they said no. Could I, could I raised a question which is mainly directed at Marilyn, but I think it's uh, also able to be thrown over to you, 
Richard, when it's ended. Another attendee has asked questions really about the criticism of the judiciary. Marilyn, I hope I don't get it wrong, but I understood what you had to say was that, of course, the judiciary is not above criticism. It's just that it should never descend into per the personal abuse, the activist judges line, or it shouldn't descend into, well, I'm going to call it ignorant abuse. And you mentioned three political instances of that over the years. What, how do we defend against that? How does the judiciary defend itself? What do we do about it? It's very, very difficult. Uh, I can tell you the things that I did. I don't profess to have a definitive answer. I saw it as very important for the court uh, of which I was head to put out to the community its work. So we utilised very extensively uh, social media and the internet so that court judgments, recordings of judgments were published, summaries, all of those things, so that that information was out in the community in addition to whatever the media was portraying. Another thing that I did was be the face of the court and it was important, and I might say difficult for me, uh, I wasn't a politician or a media performer, but I made a point of being available when appropriate to the media on um, popular radio, uh, television, and those sorts of vehicles so that the community could hear a different view as to why judges do what they do, why they sentence, what are the principles that they apply. It did seem to me that the more information that was put out to the community, it was a way of at least ameliorating to some extent the power and the reach of the media. Courts have available to them now a very significant vehicle through social media. And um, most of the higher courts have officers who constantly monitor and make sure that information is put out. If we compare the high court's um, facilitation of information uh, that is available today compared with 10 years ago, it is extremely significant. Um, use of the internet to stream proceedings. So if I take the high profile example of the Cardinal Pell case, the sentence was uh, delivered live, streamed by uh, Chief Judge Kidd. And for many people, that was the first time they actually heard and saw what a judge does in court. And it might be recalled that his honor went to considerable lengths to explain the sentencing process that a judge engages in. Um, for some, this is difficult, but we must not stop doing it. The second point I would make outside the court, there is an obligation as officers of the courts for the bar and the profession to defend the courts. And the bars generally in Australia were very good to me, but sometimes there can be a little slowness in jumping to the fore because bear in mind, um, news is um, gone in a matter of hours and replaced by something else. So having available a president of the ABA or the other bar associations is invaluable. Um, the third thing I would mention is community education. And in the Supreme Court, we had a very uh, extensive community outreach. So when judges went on circuit, they would speak at the local schools. On the court's website, there was a lot of information for schools. We had thousands and thousands of schools visit the court, uh, uh, students visit the school, uh, visit the court each year. And it wasn't unique, all courts were doing that. Uh, it is a struggle, but uh, it is important to continue to do it. Tragically, in my view, attorneys general have abandoned the courts in terms of their historic role of being the defender of the courts. 
uh, that is a travesty. And the media plays on the fact very often that it is known that the courts and the individual judge cannot respond beyond what is stated in their reasons, in their judgment. We're probably running out of time, Jeffrey. so. Uh, Hannah, I just wanted to get Richard to respond to that because I think sure. he did have something which he can add. And, Richard, I'm going to get you to build it up a bit because let's be blunt about it. In New South Wales, once the Ruby Princess inquiry became politically hot, I saw instances of personal pressure placed upon, well, you and also Commissioner Walker. Could you just add to anything which you feel free to add to what was said by Chief Justice Warren? Um, after the inquiry started, there was an article in the Australian that basically said it was a political, I'm paraphrasing, stitch up to protect the New South Wales government. Um, the commissioner didn't take very kindly to that. And uh, this is an example of something Marilyn said, the Bar Association, I think, put out a statement. Somehow in the course of this, uh, I had given an interview to Richard Acklin of Justinian a couple of years before where somewhat flippantly and clearly meaning it as a joke, in response to the question, what would I like as my last meal? I'd said I'd like Barnaby Joyce's testicles. Um, that ended up on the front page of The Australian with the clear <laughs> assertion that I could not be politically impartial in this inquiry and that I would be out to get Commonwealth government people because they were the Liberal parties in power. Um, that's obviously garbage. Um, there was a lot of other inquiries made to the commissioner by various people on what's called Sky After Dark about me, um, all of which he dealt with, but I think he probably considers that private, so I won't get into that. But uh, look, it was, uh, it was interesting, but I'm, I'm not overly scarred by it, but I frankly viewed it as fairly pathetic. Jeffrey, could I add to what Richard just said from a judicial point of view, none of the uh, negative comment that is uh, put out at times uh, is at all pleasant. Uh, you don't become a judge unless you're pretty tough in my view and you, you can't take on the role and be thin-skinned. Uh, and that's where the advocacy by others is very important. And I would not shy away from the fact that there are times as a judge where you know the sentence or the decision you are about to deliver will lead to outcry in sectors of the media. Well, it's part of your judicial function. You have to be courageous, take a deep breath, knock on the door, go into court and do your task, do your job. Thank you both for that. Um, we're running out of time, so I might need to wrap up, but uh, thanks everyone for coming. Um, and thank you again to our panelists for an incredibly yeah. interesting discussion. Did you want to- Sorry, you can't you? possibly, we, we can't possibly wrap up without this. Anybody who has got something out of this, anybody who has enjoyed it, anybody who thinks inspired, they're inspired by it, it's got to remember, this would never have happened without Han Albee. And I'm just going to say thank you, Han. It's just wonderful. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Marilyn. There was a question asked which we didn't get to from Professor Colleen Lewis, one of the greatest experts in this corner of government administration and law in this country, who found what Richard had to say, chilling was her word. And she wanted to know, what can we do about it? Well, Anybody who's out there, watch the Centre for Public Integrity and we'll try and work out something. We'll try and piece together. We'll try and work out a way. And we'll be calling upon the expertise of a number of you to do so. Absolutely. Hen, you can wind it up, but thank you, Richard, and thank you, Marilyn. Can I just also say thank you to the Centre for inviting me and I consider your work to be really important.
Thanks, Richard, and thanks, Jeffrey, and thank you, Marilyn, for the great session. And um, stay tuned, everyone, for the next uh, session on strangling accountability. We'll be looking at integrity commissions, including Christian Porter's um, new bill, um, as well as a further look at Auditor General's um, and their important role. So stay tuned for that. Thanks a lot. I'll end it here. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.